it's Adam Deport because we're service expert, author, and speaker, and I am here today with Adrian Swinsko. Adrian is a customer experience consultant and advisor and has been growing and helping to develop customer-focused large and small businesses for 20 years. He previously worked with Shell, Financial Times, The Economist Group, and has advised and consulted to numerous larger and smaller businesses. He helps them engage with their customers, build their customer retention, and improve their service and customer experience. He also recently published an excellent book, which I have right here, How to Wow, 68 Effortless Ways to Make Every Customer Experience Amazing. Adrian, how are you today? I'm very well, sir. I'm very well. Thank you very much, Adam. Thanks for having me on your show. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm so glad. I got to go right into the book title. Why 68? Because, you know, I've come through publishing and there's you know, people do 101 and 99. Where did 68 come from? Well, I know that you just, I know, well, I know that you just wanted it to be 69. Go on, tell oh. me. Oh. <laughs> yeah. now, now i got to change the rating. No, no. <laughs> to be fair, it was, um, it was an iterative process. We started with a very, very long list of potential sort of ideas. And a, and, a, and, a, and a sort of a framework and through the writing and the editing kind of process we sort of stress tested some of those ideas now they are probably some of them are probably decent ideas but they were nothing more than sort of slogans or just sayings um, right. but didn't kind of fill out into the, the the insights or the level of the depth that we wanted and so we had to discard them and some of them were just flaky and <laughs> quite fit and so we just kind of went, we whittled it down, whittled it down, whittled it down, and got to 68 that we thought, actually, they're pretty solid, I think. And so we should go with that. So no rhyme, no reason, other than that's where we ended up. All the customer service tips that are fit to print, right? Yeah, absolutely. As I can tell you, there is not a wasted chapter in the book. I've been through the whole thing. And one of the things I like that you focus on is the idea of silent complaints, which we talk about a lot but it's just one of those pernicious problems for organizations. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit, how do you identify silent complaints and address them? Um, so what's interesting is that when I talk to people about silent complaints, um, many people actually, they just, they don't quite get it. And then I, then I have to tell them a story around, you know, that sort of thing that we've all been to a restaurant it's never, you know, had an experience. It's never been quite bad enough that we that we've come that we're going to have to complain to the manager or something. But we know that we're going to resolve never to go there again, and probably tell our friends not to go there either if they ask us. Not we're not going to do it proactively, but if they ask us, we'll go. No, nah, you don't want to go there. Not good enough. So, I think where I start from when I think about all this sort of stuff when I'm talking to people about it, about it is to get them to understand that we all do it every day throughout our lives and so we have experience with it and so when we get to, when we get to the point that people understand and realize that they're already doing it and that they exist then it get, makes it easier to um, uh, to to address the situation then it comes to your kind of question around how do we address them where do we get to and I think that if people are not talking to us because the, the service is just not being quite good enough or right not quite bad enough rather for them to complain then we have to be very clever about go and very proactive about going out and asking and searching out some of these some of these issues. But to do it in a way that um, builds trust with people, because it actually, you know, here's the thing: some people feel quite sensitive about it. Companies will, but people will as well. It's like because you know they're it's not been bad enough that they want to that they'll that they they. they there's an obvious complaint. It's just not being good enough to, to merit them wanting to go there again. Some people, many people will feel embarrassed about some of that because they go, oh, is it me? Well, am I being a little bit too sensitive or whatever? And so I think we, it, this is why it's quite hard for companies. They've got to start, they've got to dedicate themselves to the fact that there are these silent complaints and there's a lot of them. Um, but they've, they've Got to make a commitment to going out and starting to talk to their, their customers in a different way. It's not just for feedback or satisfaction surveys or resolving complaints, but you have to think about it as like a third way of talking to your customers that will help you drill into these kind of these silent complaints. Well, you remember, I'm sure you know that great book, uh, Complaint as a Gift, and there's so much work we have to do around framing the idea that you want complaints. Yes. I mean, preferably you want good feedback, but if there are complaints, you want to have them, you want to be able to address them. And to get people to go from that mindset, like, I don't want to hear this negative stuff, to actually going out and seeking it, 
Yeah. I think there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, sort of cultural and mindset shifting you have to do there. I think so. But, but I also kind of think there's this thing around when you, when you talk about silent complaints, what it, the, the challenge with them is they don't quite fit into some of these formal boxes that, that normal complaints would fall into. So it's not as if something is naturally broken and therefore it, it fits a formal complaint uh, process. It's, it's generally a feeling that somebody's had or it's the way somebody's been or how thing, you know, the temperature of something or the kind of the timeliness of something. And it's not being outrageously cold or late or kind of whatever that you would make a formal complaint. It's just, it's these little things, but it's perceptions and it's on the margin. But as you know, and as I know, Adam, it's like, it's the little things and the attention to detail. And it's the hundreds, if not thousands of little things that can be the difference between whether you're just good at what you do or what you're and if, or if you're great at what you do. Oh, exactly. And it can feed a snowball effect as well. So that one complaint is sort of the death by a thousand cuts idea, right? No, yeah, completely, completely. Now, one thing about when we talk about complaints and silent complaints is it sort of segues right into loyalty because we know that silent complaints actually can end up being silent attrition. People just, they're upset or the, over time, the experience is just denigrated as we we're just talking about and they just sort of drift away. So what role do complaints and this act of seeking out of complaints have in uh, loyalty and retention? So, um, so I, I talk about this in the book actually. And, and so I think there's, I mean, so I talk about it in the book, but I think it's also, there's another dimension. I think there's three different dimensions in, in, in loyalty and the complaints um, sort of play into that. Um, there's a piece of research that I mentioned in the book, and I, I, the results of the research they did was that they asked the question, or where is loyalty generated? And of all the people that they surveyed, I think they said that around about 49% of all loyalty is generated at the point of sale, i.e. when somebody buys something uh, from you. And then, then about 40% of, um, of the people that were um, surveyed actually said that loyalty is generated at the point when something fails or something can go wrong or somebody has a question or they reach out for somebody to somebody because they don't know how something works and they need an answer to a question. And so what it shows you is that loyalty in the minds of our customers isn't necessarily isn't a program. It's all about the overall experience of it. Start from on the, on the approach to us buying something to the point of, you know, if something goes wrong or we have a question that we need an answer to, and that those, those can be the, the two sides of the loyalty in the coin. However, I think there's an emergent other um, dimension uh, in this loyalty equation, and that's, you know, that's this, is that there are many customers now that are starting to think about think more carefully about the money that they spend and the pounds and the dollars the euro or the yen and where they put them and what they get for them um, and, and so there's there's this rise in this conscious consumption conscious consumerism so and this i think this is what's interesting about it is that what it acknowledges is that we as people we want to do positive things but generally speaking most of us are quite lazy and we'll take convenience over conscience pretty much every time because that's just the way that our brain is, is wired and yet so what we see is we see a whole bunch of kind of companies that are turning around and actually starting to stand for something or to do something that matters or to contribute and this is much much bigger broader than any uh, co corporate social responsibility type of effort. This is almost like a whole DNA. This is what we stand for as company. For as a company, and what you see is many customers are now starting to pick companies because of what they do and what they stand for. In addition to how they kind of feel at the point of purchase and how they respond to when they have a problem. So I think there's a, there's this emerging dimension around. Um, almost at significance or doing stuff, doing something that matters or doing something that makes a difference in the mind of, of, of your customer. Right. And here in the States, you know, it's, uh, I don't know if it's the same over across the pond, but it's very tied to the millennial generation. The right. millennials are expecting this much more so than the previous generations. 
And uh, yeah, so what, yeah, uh, not only that, but there's something, do you have this in the uh, England, it's called a for purpose corporation. Instead of a for profit, it's a for purpose or a B corporation. And it has some sort of social good as part of its culture and ethic, which is what you were describing. I'm not sure if they use the same terminology. I'm, I'm not sure, no, I'm, they're not the same term, terminology, but I do understand what you mean. Um, but I don't think that the for purpose and for profit are mutually exclusive. So, for example, um, take um, there's a there's an America there's two American brands that, are, that that I quite like in terms of what they're doing. One is um, Tom's Shoes. Tom's Shoes, correct? Yeah. So they're uh, they're great because they're built on a mission around um, <laughs> they make they make espadrilles effectively branded espadrilles that that are. Somebody buys them and they're quite expensive espadrilles, but they're because of the price tag that people buy them because they're also quite fashionable. But the company commits to, you know, one for one. So if you buy one, they, they send another pair off to somebody else who needs them in, in South America, which is, which is brilliant. And that's kind of what drives a lot of that. Then you have people like uh, Patagonia, who's a brand that, that I really like. One, because I'm a climber and also it's run by by Yvonne Schoenart, who's a legendary climber. And they did this thing where they said, they built a, or they, they made a, uh, a, a Mendit truck that did a big tour around their, their stores. They said, don't buy our stuff, because our stuff's guaranteed for a lifetime. They said, actually, you know what? Don't buy it, don't throw it away, bring it to the shop, we'll repair it for you. And they wanted to get them into that kind of process of actually, let's look after our stuff. Let's think about the stuff that, that we're doing. And they're very much a, whilst they, they reinvest a lot in the environment and everything else, they're very much a, you know, not necessarily, I don't think they're set up as a for-purpose company. They're very, they're very much a for-profit, for-purpose. It's a very much a blend. Right. And that's, uh, that's what they are here in the States. I mean, Ben and Jerry's is an old example. They're one of the first, Ben and Jerry's ice cream to really have a social conscious message attached to their product, which was still for profit. But I want to shift gears here because there was something that stood out in your book. Uh, because I, I, in many of the books I've read, I haven't seen this uh, except for my book and yours. And that was discussing how data and privacy is impacting customer relationships. Right. And, and in Be Your Customer's Hero, you know, we, we teach something called the seven service triggers, which are seven hot buttons that set customers off. And I made the comment that if there was going to be an eighth trigger, I would probably put privacy. It's right. such a big deal now. So t talk a little bit about that. So I think, uh, so privacy is this one of this, um, these emerging kind of issues. And in the, the book, I kind of say that they, you know, um, I start talking about the, the idea that we're seeing all these data breaches, these privacy breaches. And People are up in arms about it and, and are getting nervous about what, you know, what happens and to all, all of their data and things. And what I think what we're seeing is um, emerge is there's, it's almost like a different vector, a different consumer customer demographic vector, which is around data and privacy preferences. The challenge with that is that most companies are, they're doing, they're working hard to do, um, to address this. I don't think, you know, Companies don't want to be provide slack data and privacy, you know, uh, security measures. But actually, what they, I think what they're ignoring is they're they're ignoring the customer's uh, perspective on this. Exactly. And, and and they're they're ignoring the fact that different customers will have different preferences with different brands at different points in their in their in their, their journey with those kind of brands. Now. All that does is just makes it makes the brand's um, life more complicated. And like, I'm sorry, that's just the way things are. Um, but the thing is, if they ignore it, what they end up kind of doing is they end up making some really big assumptions that can actually under could rather actually end up undermining the trust that the customers have with them, and that that just undermines the whole relationship. And so I think there's this emerging sort of dimension where many brands are going to have to start being very honest and very open with the data that they, they capture, what they do with it, how it helps them, what benefit do customers get from it? Because basically it's the customer's data, right? 
because it's their behavior, their actions. Exactly. And and people are making, you know, there's companies are collecting all this data and going, it's ours. You're like going, is that ours? Is it yours because it, um, you put in the effort to collect it? Ah, really? I'm not really sure if that, if that makes sense or not. But, you know, and all this stuff is really early days, but it all kind of like, kind of, it'll all kind of play out in the next kind of, in a few years. And it's going to be driven by data breaches, privacy hacks, all those different sort of things, but also um, developing legislation and cross-border legislation uh, as well. And so it's gonna be hugely complicated. But if companies don't wanna get caught out, they have to get stuck into this. They have to realize that this is the thing that, 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 is, that could be the, the making or the breaking of many of the relationships that they have with their customers. Because this is an evolving thing that we've never seen before. And so they have to get stuck into it. And I think they have to start wrestling with it in terms of what does it mean for them. Oh, absolutely. And I think to add on another layer, I think once you get through the mechanical, here's how we're going to treat data, how, here's how we are going to approach privacy, some of the companies that are actually doing it well are still executing poorly because they're not communicating it to the customer as well. They're actually doing good things, but their front line's not trained on it. So when somebody gets a question like, well, I don't want to give you this, what are you going to do with it? They don't know how to communicate. Hey, here's how we treat your data. Here's how we treat your information. Sure. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm gonna. This is my favorite question. I love asking people. Yeah, like, we always get asked, "What's the future of customer service or customer experience?" But I want you to take out your crystal ball. I want to know what in the future, what innovations or trends you're most excited about. What are you looking forward to? That's either coming or going to become more, you know, more prevalent. So I was at a conference in Barcelona a few weeks ago, and I was sat on a panel. Um, and they asked me a similar sort of question. They said, they started off the, 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 the questions. They said, in five years, we will dot, 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 dot. And you have to finish the sentence. And, I, and then they came to me first and I'm like, and go, and so I have to, I have nothing prepared. I didn't kind of remember this question. And I said, oh, crumbs, what's going to happen? And I, and my answer, and I don't know where it came from, but it just came from the top of my head. I said, in five years' time, we'll, we, will, we will marvel at the advancements that we've made in technology, but we will remain, at, we will remain frustrated at the progress that we've made. Makes sense. I like that. And so, um, so <laughs> that's number one. And I've got two more. One is the, um, the thing that I'm really um, interested in is something I've been banging on about for oh, a few years now. It's not a new idea, but it's I wish – companies would do more about it and that's to do end-to-end -end proactive service we have the tools for it we have the analytics for it you know we have the skill set sort of for it now i mean how much more do we need to do to get companies um vested in this idea that it's worth their time and their energy and their effort to solve problems before they before they come up we know what they are. We, we generally know what, what most of them are. It will make <coughs> excuse me, our lives easier. It will make customers' lives easier. It will make employees' lives easier. Why don't we just get stuck into it? So that's number two. And number three, which is um, the thing that I think is – I'm – I'm not sure how this is going to go, but I know it's a it's a it's a trend or it's a bigger question. I don't like the data and privacy thing. This is something that's going to that's going to grow up, and it's it's how do we blend and find the right balance between people and technology in world-beating service and experience? And I think that will be a perennial pro problem over the coming few years. I think we'll, many companies will overshoot it and undershoot it and overshoot it and undershoot it as they try and find the sort of right balance. But, but the competitive nature of, of markets may, may mean that um, we might see some big train wrecks because a lot of people overshoot it and undershoot it and there'll be some casualties along the way. But I think it's, for me personally, it's one of the central questions that is going to define the future of what is great service and great experience is how do we balance the human, the human elements with the technological element 
within uh, you know the experience that we deliver to our uh, customers because you know um, even the big the, even the big consultancies the big systems integrators you know for example Accenture I mean lo and behold have just published a report that have said said exactly the same thing that actually maybe we've gone too far on the technology because customers are saying that we've gone too far on the right. technology. I'm like, uh, maybe we should do something different. Um, which, given the way that companies have gone, it starts to become a bit of a challenge to their business model and, their, and the overall kind of economics that they've, they've built on. So this is, that's the big challenge. It's like, how do we do that? How do we, how do we make the economics and the finances kind of work? That get that human technological uh, kind of blend, and for me, that's going to be the big gorilla that's going to need to get wrestled to the ground by many of these many confirms in the next oh, five years or so. So um, I think that's exciting because it's a huge it's a huge issue, but it's not technology, if if that makes sense. More well, yeah. See, what's the total experience, and how do you? basically blend the two because I think you, you see it now. Some companies are already overshooting it and using artificial intelligence bots and things like that. And we've had a few discussions like, uh, Oh yeah, the video, right. That's going to be coming. But yeah, you know, they're overshooting it in the way that this is cheaper. Or this is a replacement as opposed to, okay, here's what this is capable of. Here's how it fits into the journey and can help the customer journey. Sure. They're just like, Oh, this is cheaper. We're getting ready to payroll. Wonderful. Yeah. And, and the experience, yeah, and then eventually the experience declines or denigrates, and it doesn't work out. Yeah, well, exactly. I think the, it's the it. What's what's fascinating is that even though we have all these technological kind of developments, um, which are I, which are I think are, some of them are really exciting. I mean, I have a I have a little saying that that I used to describe myself, which is um, I'm a lover of simplicity and the human touch with a really useful bit of technology thrown in. And in those kind of that, that's the priority as it were. Um, and what's fascinating is how, even though the, the companies are saying that we are being customer centric and we're listening to our customers and we're trying to put the customer at the center of our, of our business, that, Despite saying that, and then you have all this research and surveys and customers saying that we still want to use the phone, we still want to email you, we still want to do all these different things. We'd like to actually come and see you sometimes. You know, despite all this sort of stuff, you look at it and just go, uh, I'm not sure how that works. <laughs> and at the same time, I actually kind of look at, um, there's another fascinating thing that's, that, that, that sort of troubles me a little bit is that people talk about the millennial generation and, and, and I completely agree they are a fast growing, fast entering the workplace, digital natives, they think and behave, you know, quite differently from, from like my mum and dad, for example. Um, but yet, here's the, also the interesting kind of thing, is that my mum and dad's generation who are, you know, baby boomers, they are now sort of retired. And, but they are learning digital, but are sort of non-digital in the way that they, that they approach things. But the irony is they've, they've got most of the money. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. Yeah. They've right now they have per capita, but yeah, by far. And they will do for the next, the, the well, science, is improving and so is healthcare and things. So most people's the average age of most people, particularly in Western Europe and the you know the States, it's just going up. And so if you have the wealth is kind of there and they're non-digital, and that's just you know there. I think there's 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 large portions of the population, including if you like uh, the grey dollar or the grey pound. I'm kind of grey, but I'm not that old. But you know what I mean. <laughs> Um, like my mom and dad's uh, generation, they they have most of the wealth. They're living longer. They they have a lot of dis more disposable income, um, and yet I don't see many companies really paying a huge amount of attention or investing a huge amount of effort 
to actually build services, experience, loyalty, and so on and so forth for that generation. So there's a lot of stuff that's getting driven by technology and this big wave of millennials are coming along, but this big wave of millennials coming along, they've got no money. Oh my God, I've got to send you, um, you were a guest on the podcast, hopefully some people have already heard that, but I've got to send you an episode Jeannie and I did, we actually just did one, said don't forget the baby boomers. It was on this exact same topic because, you know, in the States, and I assume it'll be similar in uh, most of the Western democracies, we're going to have a major nursing shortage. Yeah. Because one, not only are, is everybody getting older and there's going to be more uh, demand for health care, but all those nurses that are from this glut of population are retiring. Mm-hmm. And our generation doesn't have enough to fill that pipeline. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of areas where I think people are going to have to navigate these major demographic shifts and figure out how can we deliver a customer experience in this landscape. I think that's, I think that's fair. And I think that, um, you know, what's, I think that it was interesting is that if you remember Chris Anderson uh, a long time ago, wrote a book called the long tail. Yeah. And I think what we're starting to see is that we've seen that, in there's lots of niches that develop and that was particularly relevant to you know particularly e-commerce on the on the internet and so on and so forth um but i'm actually starting to think that there's no such thing i mean there's it's almost as if there's no such thing as 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 the mass market anymore there are just different parts of the market and the question has to be is are large corporations or any kind of corporation generally, whatever, regardless of the size, if you can start marketing or start setting yourself up to be mass market, are you setting yourself up to fail? Well, you know, I think uh, on two, I would agree with that fact. And when you look at sort of the two trends behind that, which is one, the internet has made us, everybody, everybody thought the internet was going to make us all one big person, but actually what it's meant is everybody's found their little groups Sure. And, and are, are very actually more isolated in some ways. And also now we have the technology to market to those groups. You know, they didn't have that before. Mm-hmm. And even Coke, let's take somebody who's just mass, truly mass market and could probably stay that way. They still are able to target, you know, different affinity groups and different demographics and micro target and all of those different techniques. And but, the, but the interesting thing about kind of Coke, and this is almost something that just kind of happened. Well, it's, it's sort of happened by, not by stealth, but it's just sort of happened, is that Coke's turned into six Cokes. Right. <laughs> right? And so what they've done is they've gone, we've got these guys over here, and that's kind of fine, because if you like Coke, then everybody knows that a full fat, full sugar Coke, ice cold Coke on a really hot day, every now and again, you just can't beat it. Right. right, and then there's all these other kind of variations. There's the, the there's the silver, there's the white, there's the green, there's the black, there's the blue. There's all these different sort of like you noise. Know, it's like they're going for a rainbow kind of portfolio of Coke, and all that does is it speaks to it doesn't it speaks to different preferences within their their niche, and so they're doing it themselves. They're kind of they're they're ahead of it. And then also Coke as a portfolio brand. They're buying up lots of lots of little companies that are doing drinks in a different way. Like they bought Honest Tea um, a few years ago, and just because they were making a very different, very organic, very uh, non-sugar based iced tea type of drink, um, they also um, that's they were in the states. They also bought um, Innocent Drinks here in the UK, who make very fresh, very, you know, no additives, um, sort of fruit-based drinks. And, but they bought them to add them to a portfolio so they could flex their muscles around distribution and scale and and the logistics, but they didn't, they're not changing them as drinks at all because they know that they want to just build their portfolio. Which is, it's amazing. I don't know. Do you have these drink machines in the UK now? So Coke does these drink machines in restaurants. As opposed to the old, there's like five different, you know, things where the person can do a Dr. Pepper or a Coke or a Sprite. They yeah, have yeah. these, yeah, they have these machines now where you can pick like a couple of hundred of different combinations of flavors and Dasani sparkling and eight different flavors of Coke. 
and it's completely personalized. It is ins it's insane. And that's what they're starting to put in restaurants now, these amazing things where everybody can truly get the exact drink they want. Yeah. It makes, then, your, it makes your point for you. Yeah, well, that, that's true. But I think then beyond a certain kind of point, then, and this is, and this is another thing that I'm fascinated by is the, the whole psychology, behavioral economics, all that sort of stuff. Because there, there was a fascinating study that I think I mentioned in the book, and it's, it's called The Paradox of Choice. Yeah, I'm familiar with it. It's, it's, yeah. I, I teach that yeah. as well. And I think, the, it's, I think it's fascinating. And I think it's how we, we get caught up in these dominant logic type of approaches to things. And that's why I say, you know, when I said earlier on, I'm a lover of simplicity is because actually it takes courage and insight and uh, I don't know, a bit of, probably a bit, of, a bit of craziness and a bit of stupidity to take things away and reduce the complexity and make things simple because uh, it's just easier to add things than it is to take things away. And I'm not saying that we should strip things down to a choice of one, but I'm saying that when you go beyond a certain point, it's like people just go, oh, what do you mean? I can't make a decision because it's just too much. And I think that that applies to kind of many things. And I think it, you know, it might even apply to, you know, the number of customer service channels that we give customers the option of contacting us, and it's whether it's it's Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or WhatsApp or and then you can text us and you can email us and you can call us and you can even visit us in store if you like or make an appointment and we'll come around and see you. And people are like going, um. I can't decide. Well, you know, I think that would be something that would be interesting to study because the paradox of choice is very much about a purchasing behavior. Yeah. And so it'd be interesting to know if that applies or doesn't apply to, say, the effortlessness that comes from being able to choose your own channel because it sort of competes with, in that example you use. It sort of competes with effort, right? Yeah. By, by having every channel, omni-channel, not every, but, you know, all, all major channels available, you're making it easy. But are you making them less satisfied with, the choice that would that would be very interesting to study well exactly and, and, and that's kind of one of the things i'm really interested in is trying to find all these little kind of like things and then applying the principle laterally because there's no reason to think that the common denominator in all of this are, are people right if it applies over here then there's no reason to think that it may apply over here and so i think you're absolutely right studying it and finding out whether that does apply is it would be really really interesting but it's like I just get a chance to um, to look at diff different things. Like there was one that um, uh, that was interesting, which is not in the book, but it's an interesting one. There was a guy that did uh, a marketing professor at Duke University, one of your universities across in the states, and he did a uh, piece of work looking at the effects of uh, wearable technology, like Fitbit technology, on on people, and he was interested in. Um, how it affected people in terms of doing the work, uh, doing kind of more of the activity and their connect, their, their engagement with it, as it were. And so what, but what, he, what he found out was that through the study is that people would do more of the activity, but actually in doing more of the activity and the measurement thereof, the, their engagement with it and their level of well-being would go down, hmm. which is interesting. And so I thought that's interesting because, you know, it, it plays into that sort of whole idea is like in, in, you know, in business, if you go like what gets measured gets managed and you're thinking, mm, okay. But I thought, well, actually, if we're doing this kind of measurement and if there's a, if we measure something or over measure something, then it might boost the output, but reduce the well-being and the, um, the level of engagement and possibly the level of quality. I thought, well, if we take that and we apply that at an organizational level, say, for example, customer experience or customer service, NPS, contact center metrics, all of these different things, and you're like going, hmm, so if we're measuring the, excuse my language, the hell out of something, what is the impact it's having on the people that we're measuring? They might be doing more work, but actually their engagement with it and the level of quality that they're producing and the well-being that's coming out of it is going down. Right, and we could definitely, geez, this is awesome. We've like gone down the path here. We got, we, we're going to start talking about managing the metrics and uh, how that works. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you and I probably talk all afternoon. 
Um, well, great points. This was actually a fascinating discussion. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Adrian. Uh, just let everybody know where they can find you. So you can find me, um, Adrian Swinsco. So that's A-D-R-I-A-N-S-W-I-N-S-C-O-E. Or alternatively, it's written like this on the bottom of there. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> um, and that's the book. And you can find that. And so if you look at my name, you'll find me on LinkedIn, Twitter. You'll find me on my own blog. You'll find me on Forbes. Uh, you'll also find me on Amazon. That's where the book is. And so you should go and buy it. Buy the book. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> right, well, thank you so much, Adrian. Appreciate it. Cheers. Thanks.